We greet you this evening in the name that is above every name, and that is the name of Jesus the Christ, as we come on, on this day in October of 2020, we do thank God for the opportunity to come to your various homes and to be able to talk about the word of God today. We pray that all is well with your families and that God is truly blessing you. Uh, where you stand in need, we realize that he is the one from whom all blessings do flow. And we do thank God today for the ability and the opportunity to be able to come to you today. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for grace today, for Lord, all the things, dear Father, that you have blessed us with and blessed us through and blessed us to. And Father, Lord, we realize you didn't bring us this far to leave us. Our prayer, Father, Lord, today is as we look into your eternal word that you give us inspiration and, from, from under, and understanding from heaven. Lord, that you, Lord, bless our minds. Father, Lord, as we keep our minds stayed on you, Lord, as we look into your eternal word, Lord, unveil, reveal yourself to the, your people today through your word. Dear Father, that, Lord, you are true to your word and you hold your word above your own name. We do thank God today. Thank you today for all the things that you've already done, for what you are doing, for what you will do. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you have granted unto us this blessed day. Lord, we pray that you be in the midst. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. As we come today, we will finish up on our, uh, the church of Laodicea, uh, which was spoken to in the book of Revelations from uh, in chapter number three. We're going to finish up verses 18 through 22, and we're still talking about unified by grace in 2020, what unifies us and what brings us to a point where God wants us to be. And for us to be what he wants us to be, we got to be together. And, and I pray that even as we look at uh, very, uh, around our world at various denominations, there's so much division, so much opposition to unification uh, people don't want to be together sometimes. And, and it seems as if uh, Satan is working his plan to try to uh, bring division, uh, bring confusion, and, and, and bring you know, contempt among us that won't allow us to walk together. But I pray that no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. And that's why we draw strength from the word of God, uh, things that, Lord, we need to be focused in on, and that what brings us together and what brings us into a point of uniqueness where the Lord is concerned. We all are not the same. We all have different various gifts, uh, various things that will help us benefit the kingdom of God. And as we look at it, I'm so glad that he don't look at us as being the same. Uh, for you are unique and you are an, an original today. So I do thank God for you today. And I pray that God is using you highly in his kingdom. Amen. As we go to the Lord today, we're talking about strength and by grace. Again, part two, this is the last part of our series coming from the book of Revelations. Uh, speaking on grace, uh, things that, that God granted to them, that unmerited favor. Today, we're going to be talking about counsel, counsel, counsel. And another word that we're going to be talking about is zealous. Uh, counsel means advice given, especially as a result to correct behavior or a plan of action to purposely guard thoughts and intentions or give guidance in the right direction. A lawyer representing someone in court who has understood the need for mediation. Uh, when we look at that, we start to look back on it. We had counselors, guidance counselors in our schools, counselors, people who gave us good advice. Uh, they didn't tell us, you know, you've got to do this but they would give you guidance in the right direction, knowing that you were not them, but they wanted to see what was best for you. Guidance counselors. 
And, and I'm so glad that when we look at it, this word helps us to understand uh, Isaiah ver chapter number nine, verse six, where it says, for unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name. Listen to what it says here. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's in Isaiah 9 and 6. Uh, one of the attributes or one of the parts, uh, the attributes of his name is Counselor. Uh, that means he knows where you need to go. And he's going to give advice on how to direct you. But it's up to you to heed the advice. He's the counselor. And as, as, as I said, one who advocates for your good, your lawyer, he, he ain't going to get up there and tell all the stuff that, that you know, you should be found guilty of. He's going to advocate for you. He's going to give guidance and, and especially give up all the good things that will, will, will bring exoneration in your way. But when you look at it, you've got to heed advice. You've got to sit and let him stand. Now, I'm saying this in particular because we're going to go over this again here in just a minute. You're going to sit and let him stand and give and, and, and more or less talk about your case. The judge don't want to hear from both of y'all. You, He's the counselor. He wants to hear what the counselor has to say on your behalf. All you got to do, if you are good, if you are a, a good defendant, you'll sit there and let your lawyer speak for you. He stands and gives the understanding of your benefits and wants what's best for you. The other word we're talking about today is zealous. Zealous means marked by fervent in, or energetic partisanship. That means that, that you are looking for the best. You are fervently going after something uh, to show support for an ideal or a cause. That means also feel with an overwhelming desire or energy to see something succeed. Uh, when we push for the Lord's agenda, not our own agenda, when we put for the, uh, the Lord's agenda, we are speaking of zeal toward him. And we're speaking of his will be done. Uh, when you say thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We want to make sure that his will will be done, not only in heaven, but here on earth. And for his will to be done, he got to have some zealous folk. That means you're on fire. That means you are uh, you're more or less moving forward to, to more or less promote his kingdom. Not your, not your kingdom. He ain't here to promote yourself. You're here to promote him and to tell of his goodness. And the more you, you put forth him, the more you lift him up, the blessings do come your way. God has a way of getting the blessings back to you. You can't lift him up or you can't get him up no higher and when, then, then he can more or less pull you up. He's the one that exalts you. And I'm so glad that when the Lord exalts you, no man, nobody else can bring you down. Amen. So as we go to here, the church of Laodicea was faced with being able with was faced with being able to see themselves as the Lord saw them. Now, if you picture in mind, if you go back in the, the scriptures where the Lord was speaking to the church of Laodicea, he had a problem. There in verse number 17, he said, because you say you are rich, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There are three things the Lord wants to be brought out here. Uh, there are three characteristics that he wants to deal with with this church at Laodicea. Then maybe they can see themselves as he sees them, the characteristics he focused uh, on were poverty, nakedness, and blindness. Now, if you look back on the church at Laodicea, they were very prideful. They were very prideful people. They were uh, energized by the commerce around them. So they were rich 
in some aspects. In the physical aspects, they were rich. And needless to say, richness or the prosperity led to self uh, self dependence. They didn't depend upon the Lord. And the atmosphere around them came into the church in that they became in the, they became uh, so so point of a uh, pumped up that they forgot who bought them to where they were. Uh, they forgot the understanding that so the Lord had to take them around about and show them by their surroundings who they were. So when the Lord dealt with them, he also dealt with the, the understanding we talked about last week. He said, I wish you were hot or cold. The things that came into them, when they started at their destination, it was hot. When it got to them, it was lukewarm. And their lukewarmness came over where the church is concerned. The Lord said, now I wish you were hot or cold. One or the other. Because you're lukewarm, I spew you out. Meaning that there's a point I will refuse you. I want you either hot or cold. Either you love me or you don't love me. Either somewhere, there's no middle ground where the Lord is concerned. So when we see this, he says, now there are three things I want to deal with here. First, your poverty. I know you say you look good, you rich, you got all kinds of things going on. You're rich in commerce, you got a medical school going on. You got all kinds of stuff going on at the, at the, at, in, in Laodicea. So even in that, I want, you, I want you to know what I see. I see poofo. I see poverty. The Lord says, I see a poverty of poverty people, meaning he said, I counsel you to buy of me. Lord said, I want to give you some good advice. You won't, you, you probably won't hear me, but I want to give you some, okay? I want to give you some good advice. I want you to counsel you. He says in verse number 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness does not do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. He takes here and talks about their poverty. He said, I counsel you to buy me gold. Now who in their right mind would go with a pocket full of money and say, Lord, let me buy some gold for you? That's not what he's talking about here. In this, he goes right back when the Lord speaks. His word confirms what he says. He says, I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire. Now, when we go back to Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, the 55th chapter, Isaiah chapter number five, 55, Isaiah chapter number 55, starting with verse number one, we'll see where the Lord is speaking here. And he speaks to a greater understanding and helps us to see what he's talking about. He says in verse number one of chapter number 55, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. The Lord said, you don't have to have anything to come and get what I have. Hey, I ain't going to put a wholesale, I ain't going to put a discount on it, I ain't going to put nothing, no price on it. I want you to come. If you come, they'll let me know you want it. So he says, not only you can come without money and without price, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? He said, why are you paying for something that really is not going to replenish you? Why are you putting forth your efforts to buy something that really is no good for you? And he says, and your labor for which that you labor for which that satisfy not. So you're laboring for stuff that don't even satisfy you. And this is what leads to, to your, your, your miserable, you being miserable. And he says, hearken diligently unto me. This is uh, chapter number 55, Isaiah, verses 1 through 3. And eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight. In the fatness, in its, itself, in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So he says here, 
He don't put a price tag on you. He said it's already paid for. All I want you to do is come and acknowledge that you want it. So what the Lord is saying here, even when he comes down to this verse, and he said he mentions this again in chapter number 11 of Matthew, chapter number 11 of Matthew in verse number 28, when he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He says this for the simple fact he knows that people are impoverished by the simple fact they're working, uh, trying to get a dollar, trying to get ahead, only to find themselves broke, busted, and disgusted, and not understand that he said, why are you trying to satisfy yourself with something that really is not going to satisfy you? You spend money for that which satisfies not. Quit all this looking for stuff and Find me, come to me, and, and yield yourself to me. I'll give you what you need. You don't have to pay no money for it. But when he says here, I, I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire, he's talking about not a price. The price has already been paid where salvation is concerned. The Lord Jesus done paid the price himself. All you got to do is accept it and believe it and trust in it that it's already taken care of. The price has already been paid for you. So needless to say, note to self. And I want you to put this down, write it down, put it where you can read it and understand it. With prosperity comes the measure of self-induced pride. And that produces independence. Be careful of prosperity. Be careful. Be aware of it. For the simple fact the Lord wants you to be blessed, but he don't want the blessings to have you. Okay. Because I believe he reminded the children of Israel, when we go back to De in Deuteronomy, where he says, now listen to me. I'm going to bring you to places of wells you didn't dig. I'm going to bring you and let you live in houses that you did not build. And when you got to that point and you've eaten of the vines that you did not plant and be careful and beware when you eat thereof and you say, you know, and you begin to be self so prideful that you say that, you know, you forget about the one who bought you to where you are. The Lord says, beware. Don't you look at the blessing and, and more or less forsake the bless or. And that's what happens here. He says, look, don't you become independent where I'm concerned. I'm trying to get you to understand I've got more for you, but you can't look at it and not adjust your eyes upon me. So the Lord wants them to not be in poverty, but they are in poverty because they allowed their surroundings to come upon them. So needless to say, he not only talked about their poverty, he talked about their nakedness. We talked about last week. That even when the, the when Adam and Eve sinned, they took fig leaves and covered themselves. That was a part of religion. The Lord didn't want them to be religious. He wanted them to know it's going to take blood for you to be covered. So he, he, he took the fig leaves away and gave them coats of skin. Read it for yourself. Back in the third chapter of Genesis, he took coats of skin and covered their nakedness. And the Lord is saying today that even I, you might be dressed with the finest Gucci or Pucci, whatever it may be. He ain't looking on the outside. He's looking on the inside. You can be dressed to the nines on the outside and look good and, and smell good and all that. But the Lord looks beyond the out exterior and looks to the interior of the heart. He said, needless to say, he said, Needless to say, you are, I want you to buy of me, uh, I want you to get of me white apparel. I've got something ready for you. White apparel means purity. That as a part of a understanding that the Lord has something greater for you. When people see you, they, I, I, they ought to see a garment. Mm, let me say that again. They ought to see a garment that is unstained. And, and needless to say, your garment says a lot about where you are and where you're going. Your garment speaks to where you're going. But if they see spots on your garment, they're going to focus in on the, the spots more so than they would the garment. That's why the Lord says, I want you to buy, you know, to, to, to I'm going to clothe you with white, 
reigneth, which means that there's a purity. There's not to the point that you're sinless. I want to continue to wash you clean, but I want you to understand that you're naked. You got to understand, you got to admit first that I'm naked before the Lord can clothe you in that purity. He speaks to their nakedness from which, you know, they could not see with their natural eye how they look. But he wanted them to see they were self-righteous and a that needed to be pur uh, purified apparel. White raiment spoke to their apparel as to be free from sin and degradation that went in with, with it. Sin, the word of God tells us, is a reproach to any people, but righteousness exalts a nation. Blindness, I'm going to speak to that point. They had a medical school there that produced cholera, which was used as eye cell to improve the sight. Though they may have the physical sight, they can improve the physical sight, but to have spiritual sight, you're going to have to see it as God wants you to see it. You have to have spiritual discernment. Though they have improved physical sight, they were still spirit, they, without, without spiritual discernment. They needed spiritual discernment to be able to understand or see things where God wants them to see. Another scripture I want you to keep in mind is 1 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 14, which says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The Lord wants you to know, but he ain't going to break down the walls to, to get you to see it. You've got to be able to spiritually see what he's offering to you. Now, we go to another verse right here in verse number 19. I want to specifically pull this out because it, it holds true to a fact. He said, as many as, as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, when he speaks to this, he speaks to the part of chastening. Uh, sometimes, you know, we want to be children, but we don't want to, you know, get a whipping every now and then when we've gone done wrong or gone, gone outside the will of God. Now, I, I'm so glad that, that we deal with a father that still uh, will, will take you to the woodshed every now and then once you've done wrong. And, and it used to be, you know, we used to hate when our, for, our fathers would take us to the woodshed or chasten us uh, with rods of correction. Uh, but they did it in love. And just like our regular fathers did it in love, our spiritual father, our heavenly father, does it the same way. He does it in love because he wants to see correction. He wants us to go in a, a different direction. He's still counselor. And he wants us to go that places that will benefit us. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11 speaks to the chastening of the Lord. He says, and ye have, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou, when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, listen to what he says, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all are whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had our fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be subject in, in subjection unto the father of the spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening or present of the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward he yield the peaceful fruits of the righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Long term short, the Lord chastens those who are his. If you belong to him, you're going to have to endure some chastening. That means the Lord's going to call you out on your wrong. And when he calls you out, don't go pout. Don't you go stick your lip out. Don't blame your brother or sister. 
when the Lord deals with you, he brings correction. He does it because he loves you. So when I look at that, the Lord's chastening comes with re relationship. He exhorts uh, the church at Laodicea uh, to them to be on fire. Be on fire for him. He exhorts them in this verse. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous. Be on fire for me. Don't be cold-hearted like you don't know who, who I am. Uh, be zealous. Be on fire for me. And, and understandably so. He says, and repent. That means turn from the wicked ways. Now I'm going to get to another part here, and I'm going to close out on this part. He said, this sets the stage for many of our local assemblies. The Laodicean church was at a stage by which the Lord is, is striving to get their attention. He says in verse number 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. Notice the way he is. He's not walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks now. He's on the outside. He's on the outside knocking on the door, which means that there's uh, someone he wants on the inside, but the latch is on their side. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That means that there's a part of subject the Lord wants to come in. He ain't going to break the door down. He don't have one of those police knockers that knock the hinges off the door. He ain't going to do that. The Lord is, is a gentleman. He's not going to knock and, and break in your house. But he wants you to open up. And the knock is an invitation. Not only an individual invitation, but it's a universal invitation. The Lord wants not only the world to hear, but he wants the individual to hear. The individual has to be able to hear the knock. And when you hear the knock, you can say, well, I don't know where he is. And shout to the one on the outside, go on about the business. We don't want none. Uh, we gave it to office or whatever you want to say to him. But you know the one on the outside wants to come in to you. And, he, and, and you know who it is. And, and sometimes, brothers and sisters, and you know, people say, well, something told me. Well, that something is someone. Something told me uh, the Lord wanted to get my attention. Yeah, he got your attention. It's not like he tried to get your attention. He's going to get your attention. But he's knocking on the door. He has gone from, from sitting in the midst of them to standing on the outside knocking, which means at some point they had put him out. At some point they had relinquished their ability to, to embrace him. So the Lord says, I stand at the door and knock, which means somebody put me out here. <laughs> but I, I'm still wanting a relationship. And that's when he stands at the door and knock. This offer is to whoever on the inside will hear and open the door. Fellowship means that you intentionally, you intentionally went and opened the door to be with him and that you wanted him to come in with you. The message to the overcomer in verse number 21, and we're going to close. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me on my, in the throne? Needless to say, when you listen to what the Lord says here, you've got to go back to Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the, 20, the 20th chapter, verses 20 through 23. And, and I say that in particular because at this point, Matthew 20 and verse 20 through 23, there's a, a desire made for and it was something that, at, that was asked for, but they didn't understand what they were asking for. Matthew 20, verse 20, 20 says, Then came unto him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said it unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus said, answered and said unto her, you know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I am? I drink of, I shall drink of, or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, we are able. And he said unto them, ye shall indeed, uh, uh, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. 
but to sit on the right hand or on, and on my left is not mine to give, but shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Now, they were seeking something. They were seeking advancement without understanding a price must be paid. They were seeking something for nothing. They wanted prestige. They wanted a crown but did not understand you got to go through something to get it. When we understand, when we exalt or want things or want to be in positions uh, that we really haven't uh, paid for or pray the price to get, then we're going somewhere really the Lord doesn't want us to go. He, got to tell, he told them, he said, can you drink of the cup that I drink from? They said, yeah, we can drink of it. They didn't understand what they were talking about. These were disciples that had to go through some things. They had to be um, sawed asunder. They had to be, uh, they went through a lot just for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus. But to understand, to be exalted, you got to understand what it means to go through. Uh, these were, this was a, uh, a request that really they didn't understand. But in Revelations, he says unto them, he says to them, he said, I will even also to them that overcome, even as I also overcame and I sat down on the right hand of the, uh, the father in, in his throne. Jesus said, I finished my work. And until you finish work, you can't sit down. He, he's standing at the door knocking. He's sitting at the right hand of God. What is he sitting there doing? He's making intercession for you and me. He's pleading our case, even when we've done wrong. I understand greatly that there are things in life that we're going to go through, brothers and sisters. But to understand, that's going to be a payday. That's going to be a great payday. But you have to put in your time before there is a payday. And to understand the things that you go through, you're going to suffer some things. But the Bible speaks of reigning with him. To understand of reigning, you can't reign until you suffer with him until you suffered for his cause and to understand suffering for his cause don't mean I, I, I'm going to be a doormat. I, it means to a point I've got to be able to do the very work that the Lord has called me to do and to be able to do it without griping and complaining and understand he gets all the glory. So even to a point, brothers and sisters, when we get to heaven, I'm so glad we talk about this, that there's going to be some crowns given. And we talked about this earlier in our studies the crowns that are given are going to be not for us. They're going to be for him because he allowed us to overcome so much. And brothers and sisters, when we overcome, it gives him glory. And it helps us to understand there's nothing too hard for God. And when there's nothing too hard for God, smile when you go through adversity. When you go through these various things, smile and know God is working it out for your good. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Today he's speaking to the church age as he has in the past. And this is the understanding. This him standing at the door and knocking, that's the latter part of the church age as of today. He's knocking on the door. Will you answer? So we thank God for the opportunity to come to you today. We recognize it's getting late in the evening day of life. And the sun is going down. My prayer is that God will bless you and that he will bless you real good. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share with your people today. Bless us, Lord, continually, Lord. We pray, Lord, for that sinner that may have heard this word and want to turn their life over to you and open the door. Father, I pray, dear Father, that, Lord, you, Lord, will usher in or bring them to understanding. If they open the door, you'll come in and have a relationship with them. And, Father, Lord, we pray. Dear Father, that you turn a life around today, that they may see you in the newness of life. Now, Father, Lord, we thank you for those who are born again. Father, that you continually add into our life. And we thank you for what you give us on a daily basis to help us to know we are more than a conqueror through you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. May heaven smile on you until we see each other on next week. May he continue to grant you his peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name. Amen.